Hey, Ed, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. You, am I, I getting through? You. Good. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Got to turn on the switch. Yeah. Well, you that's know. why they're electronic devices, Michael. They, they have switches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to come, I'm trying to cross the metaphor with our nervous system without uh -huh. it can't, without it being mechanical and I can't come up with anything. Well, that's their limit their limits to uh, you know to all of the technical technological metaphors that we're using these days. There was a I remember back in the 70s when I was doing my master's thesis here in Germany I had to uh, I, w I wanted to come up with a the, like a model of mind for learning foreign languages. Oh, wow. the only thing, that, yeah, the only thing that was available at the time was was uh, depth psychology here in Germany and and behaviorism. And I've never been a big fa fan of behaviorism, and depth psychology really doesn't doesn't lend much to it. And that, it was right at that time. This was in the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, cognitive psychology came up, so we started getting more mathematical model. There was Mm -hmm. Mulhard had this model of schemata that we have kind of like frames in our, our frameworks uh -huh. in our minds that we use. And, and that was that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. At the same time, let's say mind processing at like computers or data processing came up. And so the, the, a metaphor was introduced that the mind is like a computer. Yeah. And it was it wasn't more than 10 years later that the metaphor took over and now everybody believes the metaphor and not that it was the metaphor for it. So exactly, we, exactly. We say everything in terms of that, although it was actually originally the other, well, as many things are the other way around. Right. So right. I found, I found this development very amusing on the one hand, very frustrating on the other, because you can't get through to people who, who don't understand that that was a, that was a metaphor. And, <laughs> right, and it's not—it's not actually a very good one either. Yeah, come to find out, it's not. No, no, no. It's got way too limited for for what's going on. Yeah, and oh. uh, I think it's Andy, Andy Clark. I just read a book of his. He's really into the neuroprocessing, and mm -hmm. from what I understand, and I love his metaphor: surfing uncertainty. Yeah, that's. I'll go that's, with that metaphor over the computer. <laughs> well, living in California, you have to. So. <laughs> <laughs> All life can be expressed in terms of surfing. <laughs> that's yeah. what I learned in 14 years there. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting yeah. that metaphors too can be um, geo uh, geographically specific. Yeah, people yeah. gather those metaphors from the area that they live in, the yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing like relating what you're doing to real life, you know, yeah. <laughs> as you experience it. You know, it's yeah. Very helpful kind of thing. Exactly. So, yeah. Look who all showed up. This is amazing. Wow. The fantastic five. And everybody here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love I it. I only feel half here. I don't feel very prepared to participate full-throatedly in a, in a in a conversation like this uh yeah. I was well i i remember a time a long time ago where you just showed up and talked for an hour <laughs> i just showed up so we were unprepared uh, then stared, too. At the, stared at the camera <laughs> I was hoping somebody else would be on the other end so looks like <laughs> looks like it i started something mm -hmm. uh, and and i mm -hmm. actually enjoyed listening to you all talk better than uh, I sometimes enjoyed just being present. It kind of gave me mm -hmm. a nice distance to appreciate some of the, uh, you know, some parts of the conversation in a way where if you're in the midst of it and, you know, thinking, listening, responding in the yeah. moment, you don't always get to appreciate. So um, yeah. I'm almost of the mind to shut off my camera and fade into the background. <laughs> you, you all talk. <laughs> It's typically my theory too. Yeah. <laughs> we, we could all use that theory and then we would just sit here in a Zen like meditative <laughs> for the next hour and a half. Yeah, we'd go 
we go uh, some kind of Zen meditation online. <laughs> All right. I've done that. Uh, the Buddhist Geeks, they have a podcast. Been yeah. Time, and uh, th he had a little community, an online community going for a while. And that was one of the things that they did is virtual retreats or virtual sittings. So uh -huh. at one point they were doing, um, um, they kind of had a little community, um, like, like Infinite Conversations. And they were doing twice a week and he recruited some of the volunteers to each lead individual sittings and um, things, you know, that movement, I guess, uh, dissipated and now he's doing something a little bit different, but um, it's a little weird. I think, you know, sitting in front of a camera and seeing a, a person on a screen and having, um, um, there's a certain kind of telepresence, I think, that, that occurs, but, um, and there's a practice, I think, involved in sitting with that analog digital, you know, divide or disjuncture. Uh, and, you know, ultimately it's all part of one reality. So it, it really should work. I mean, there, there's nothing in, like, absolutely inherently essentially wrong with it, but it is a little bit awkward for sure. It's, it, and I think I prefer usually just sitting by myself or with other people uh, in, in, you know, in the person, in the flesh. Oh, well, I found in, what's interesting is this has actually helped me when I'm in person with people. <laughs> Believe it or not, there. Uh, I guess I don't know what it is, but it's actually kind of helped me hone my skill when I am in person with people. Because maybe that's because uh, I feel safe from this different distance, and I can just shut off the camera. Versus when you're with somebody, you got to walk away sometimes. And I and I've been highly aware of how I get triggered because of my past. I have a I have a question. Mike, do you, after we finish these, do you ever watch them again? Oh, yeah. I've watched every one again to, to, to observe myself, my, my interactions, you know, and, uh, the con and, tr and go, over, go over the content that was discussed, you know, myself. Uh, well, I, mean, I think that, I think watching yourself, like you said, helps you with your interpersonal communications because you you watch yourself and then you make adjustments just like a a baseball player or an athlete they watch film of themselves mm -hmm. to see what you know see what works and and what doesn't and in a sense this is this is sort of like that yeah and i also i and my point of view is that as my, there are differences, but I've been thinking about this a lot, but there's some in the sense that you could be, you know, the difference is here, we're not in the same physical space. That's, that's true. But I, I think I, you can be with somebody and not there too, <laughs> you know, face to face. So there's this check at, there's this, I don't know how to describe it, gap that works in both places depending on who's across, who's across from you. You know, um, example I have is I'm, I'm very sensitive and aware when I work with the homeless of their mental states of how you can be talking to them and you can notice they're, they're somewhere else. They're not, they're not with you. And so you have to be patient with that, you know, and work with it. So, does that it does is that kind of making sense what I'm saying is how they both kind of feed into each other, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think there's an intentionality that okay. we bring to these conversations and that intentionality to yeah. be present to listen, to prepare if there's you know a topic that's uh, planned and, and gonna be discussed. But but even if there isn't to be present, that's yeah. something that doesn't necessarily happen in everyday life so even just wherever you do it whether it's here or online maybe it's e or, or offline maybe it's maybe just having a container to do it online trains the mind to then do it offline as well very good that's what I, that's what i was trying to indicate that's the way i'm looking at it i have a personal example which we we tend to bring these conversations anyways but um it was funny once i joined this community very 
with much trepidation for my personal speaking ability and anxiety that comes up any any time I speak. Uh, that's not really present anymore. And I guess November last year, I joined this uh, um, cafe discussion. And then in January, in real life, um, I became co-clerk of the Quaker meeting, kind of unexpectedly, which involves making announcements um, during and after the silent worship meeting um, and taking care of business. Um, if you imagine maybe what Marco does here in the background um, with emails and answering this and that, um, I'll be along. I'm a co-clerk, so there's another individual. But I, was, I guess what I'm getting at is there's, I, I don't have a chance to review my performance in that, that venue there. Um, so I, I get feedback from people afterwards saying, oh, you did a great job, or um, you forgot to talk about this, or uh, you, you didn't speak loud enough. So I, I get direct feedback from people, but it is very odd or a difference from, say, what happens here with occasionally I'll review a conversation and I'll see how I was speaking. I don't get that review in real life, um, which would be very helpful. So that's a great positive feature of these online conversations. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I'm also taking the reviewing and the, the conversations that we have here out into the real world, out into the, the clerking I do. Um, just there, there's, I, I don't feel nervous anymore and it's uh, a great feeling. Of course, I'm still awkward. I, I know that for a fact and I can realize that, but uh, it, that's fading as well. There's no disclaimers that I'm stating very frequently as, as I was originally. Oh, pardon my um, jumbled speech here or my ill-formed ideas. It, I, I realize that's something I'm cutting through um, to get to the point. So, yeah. You've recognized that we all, all suffer from that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> So, hello, John. Good afternoon. Hello, good everybody. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, I'll say I'll say good evening, John, since it's oh, good evening. <laughs> we have an, an international traveler over here. <laughs> <laughs> Another continent. Good evening. <laughs> what time is it, by the way, Ed? It is uh, 2013. It's a quarter after eight. 20, okay. Yeah. That's not too bad. We have on the Orobindo call, there, there are Germans who appear on the calls and it's like one o'clock in the morning over there. I, and I think that's dedication. <laughs> yeah. I, I take, I've been taking online Hebrew courses for three years. And on, in the original course that we had in the A level, we had out of 14 people, four of them from our, were from Australia and they were up at four in the morning to be in the class. Wow. So, <laughs> well, which I call dedication. You know, it's like I, I schedule that later in the day. But when you're the, on the other side of the world, I guess it's a little difficult to do that. Yeah, that's why I can't make some of the some of the sessions that you have because for me it would be two in the morning, and I have to get up at six to take the get ready to take the grandkids uh, to kindergarten and stuff. So, yeah. But it's all it's all relative time wise. So are we all here of our free will and accord? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those of us who have one. Yeah. Or the illusion of one. Which which I love to play with illusions, you know. Which the definition of illusion to me doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just it's limited. It doesn't it contain the whole reality. It, it exists. Just it's closed off, just like a theater piece. It's boxed in. I, so I, I, I'm, I wonder. Uh, um, this is just arising. Moment of awkwardness. Uh, but listening to your recording, reading some of the online dialogue. Um, you know, c considering like what are the different ways that one could approach a question like this? You know, there's just the straight up philosophical debate. There's the poetry and music and the other 
elements that can be brought brought into it. Um, and there, there's like the performative. Here we are right now. We can investigate our own freedom or determinism in, in a much more direct way than talking about ideas, perhaps. But what are the, like, I guess one question I might ask as a follow-up is what can we learn about how to about quest about questions like this and even about this specific question and how it's discussed since we're kind of talking about how we talk and how in these events we're you know we're bringing a certain intentionality to it that translates into other domains as well is there something about like is there another way to f frame or approach that question that maybe gives it opens it to a new possibility well, may I, I, I'm a little bit late. What was the question, may I ask? Well, in the last conversation, the last cafe, uh, the, the overall topic was existentialism. Right. And then that became, a, I think, a, a, a rubric for a whole bunch of other interesting uh, conversations, which circled around this f tension, this difficulty between the idea that we have free will and that we make choices that are not, um, you know, that are subjectively driven, let us say, um, versus that if you look at various, all the various sciences and different ways of uh, factoring uh, how conditions affect behavior, that we don't. Uh, and, you know, I think from the very beginning of that conversation, there was a challenge to the notion that that's necessarily a binary. And I think the, you know, Ed, um, Mike, Mike uh, Doug, each, I think, presented some different ways of approaching that, um, whether that from a contemplative, like, practice-oriented perspective, which I think I was getting from you, Mike, mm -hmm. and you know, from Ed. Um, I think you reframe this more along the lines of, of, like, philosophical assumptions that are made. And, you know, if you hold X to be true, then, you know, there are implications to that. The, and also that it means you're presupposing why to be true before that. So looking at those starting assumptions, um, from, from Mark, what I, what I hear is, is a, a kind of bringing attention back to, um, to the ways in which uh, we are constrained and limited and what kinds of, um, you know, what, what the implications of that for how, uh, all kinds of things politics, uh, business, etc. I mean, psychology, you know, you, you, you bring it back to that. And I, I wasn't quite clear, like, what comes out of it? Like, is there, is there a sort of a novel emergence? Is there a new way of looking at the issue, a new way of looking at the problem? Because there's also something like, John, you point out, tiresome about the debates. So, but there's, I think, something creative about them as well if we can push through to that next. I, I, I don't think it's tiresome. I think it's destructive. You, you say it's creative, I say destructive. You say Can tomato, I, I say tomato. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. I can uh, challenge that in that the last, the last video I posted was, I think it's just 10 minutes of... Uh, somebody puts the question to a another philosopher professor and he he goes through the the argument fairly quickly the biological argument and 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 acknowledges that most biologists psychologists understand that free will is an illusion but that you have to you have to have it and the positive that comes out of it is that it increases your ability to forgive people because you become aware that there are all these forces directing our behavior and we're not aware of them. And that once you become aware of that, you're a lot you allow yourself to be more forgiving to other people because you have to forgive yourself for some of the things you did and you realize that hey 
So it elevates forgiveness. And that's a positive of understanding the biology and the cultural and the environmental can, uh, things. Can I respond? Sure. To that um, you say free will is an illusion and it is a necessary illusion. That's my position, yes. My question is, what kind of an illusion is a necessary illusion? Well, because with, without the construct of, of uh, people do things with intention, and of course they do, they're just not aware of all the drivers. But so it's, and the argument, and, and I think both, both the clips I put forth was, <clears throat> if you're not responsible for your actions, you, you, crime and punishment like <laughs> goes away. And, and, and the one discussion was, would people run amok if everybody uh, believed that, that there were forces beyond their control making them do things? Would it just turn into this crazy world uh, with no uh, direction or, or anything? And they've done experiments and they find out that, no, that's not the case. Actually, people become more, like I said, more forgiving, more compassionate when they understand that, that they're, they're not really in control. So, so it's like a, 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 a good illusion. A good illusion. And I assume there may be bad illusions. Who decides the difference between a good illusion and a bad illusion? Well, and, driver, and there's also drivers, you said, that are not always aware, that people are not aware of. Sure. So is there a relationship between good illusion, bad illusion, and a self who decides, well, who has some free will? No. <laughs> It isn't. It's it's again. We're social. We're social creatures, and and so we have to form some sort of of uh, let's call it government. We have to have a way. We make these laws, so so that's how it gets decided. Whatever whatever the group is, like this is a this is a group, and and. Marco and Caroline and the other founders are struggling now as sort of bylaws. What are the what are the rules or laws that that are going to govern this? And and so whenever people interact, that's one of the first things they do. They have to come up with an order. And we've had that conversation about religion. That religion provides order. Uh, and then, you know, we can just go, I, some of my thought thinking is I had go all the way back to the primal horde and uh, the most interesting question to me <laughs> is that, is that period of time when the transition, the separation between, uh, primates, apes and humans, when that diverged, that to me is fascinating. And I, play all kinds of head games, how that went down. Well, I'm, I'm holding the tension here, okay? I feel like there's a, a lot of paradoxical language being used, and that may be necessary. It might be unnecessary. <laughs> At any rate, I think that's what fiction is for. We make things up, we rehearse it, we play it out, it's a flop. Or it's a big hit, or it's a dud, or something in between. <clears throat> um, I'm quoting Hamlet here. There is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. He goes on to say that to him, Denmark, which he's the prince of, is a prison. So which mark? What mark? Hamlet. He says, 
There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. He's referring to Denmark. I got, oh, Denmark, the country? Yes, that's where Hamlet, Hamlet was the prince of Denmark. Oh. Um, so he recognizes, and I think I'm quoting a little bit from um, Infinite Jest. Uh, I could be uh, bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite jest were it not that I have bad dreams. He says that in the same speech, actually. I think it's a, it's a bit of prose rather than in, in blank verse. Um, but I think there's a lot of depth to Hamlet's remark. And of course, the drama that he's enacting is a pretty intense one because he's a modern man who lives in a primarily magical, mythical age. And he's trying to figure out, he's, he saw uh, his father's ghost, right? Comes back to tell him uh, he has to get revenge um, by killing the, the current king who happens to be his uncle because his, the, that king who's the current king murdered him in his sleep while he was taking a nap and then married the queen who is Hamlet's mother. So we have a very complicated drama. And uh, Hamlet says, well, I don't know. This may be the ghost of my father. It could be the devil who wants to take me to jam my soul and send me to hell. Um, so he has to arrange some sort of verification process. He needs some evidence, more evidence than just, oh, I'll just go take a sword and go stab my, my, my uncle, the king. Because I, and I can tell the people, I saw a ghost of my father who came back and told me to do this. Um, so he arranges to have a play performed. And he, in, in the, the actors come and he says, I want you to play this play. And I, it's an it's a old melodrama that they're very familiar with. And I want to insert these lines. And the lines are very pointed towards, um, so there's an, a play about, someone who murders their brother, a man comes out on stage and kills, pours poison into his brother's ear while he's taking a nap and the guy dies. And the actor who's playing that part adds a few extra lines, which create the real conditions of the king, his, his uncle, the real king of Denmark, who stands up and screams, let there be light. And he runs, he flees from the stage. And that's when Hamlet says triumphantly, that he's, he's caught the king. Um, now, still, where's his evidence? His evidence is still based on very affective response to the king's affective response. He's created circumstances where he believes he's captured the conscience of the king. But it's a fiction, it's a play. It's a play within a play, probably a meta play. One of the great, uh, I think Shakespeare was a, a meta, meta, taking a meta, meta perspective in this particular play. I'm just bringing this up because I'm trying to hold this tension that you're presenting about free will. There's no such thing as free will. It's an illusion, but it's a necessary illusion. Um, and rather than just have a, a knee jerk response, because I reject it, I reject totally the idea that I have no free will. I can get a, you know, I can get a Uzi and go and blow people up with it. Everyone can do that, and people are doing that. Most people aren't doing that, and I wonder why. It may be because they have an imagination they can use so that they know that there can be consequences to their actions. Now, I'm, I am presenting a little drawing that I did in, um, we, got a, we got together, Michael and Douglas and I. Last week. Yeah, and I, I was working with a, with a clean start, something clean that I wanted to work with. And I, I like this drawing, and I presented it also on the Orbindo. Um, and I'm presenting it here again, because I'm moving towards, I want a coherent we space. And this is a drawing that I made, and there's a little story attached. These are the birds that are going and doing their own thing. Some of you have already seen this before, if you were in the Aurobindo or in that meeting with uh, Michael and Doug. These are the birds who are going in different directions. Now, the birds, uh, no bird can fly off long distance by itself. But if they form a group, they have a formation, a flock, they can travel thousands of miles over landscapes that are very, very different from year to year. And they can end up in the location um, 
these migrating birds that are thousands of miles away. And they must be able as a group to detect patterns in their environment to pull something like this off. We don't know exactly how they do it, but we do know that they are looking around and they're noticing things that repeat themselves or, or, or repeat themselves with variations enough so that they can get to this long distance. And I'm just using this as a metaphor for a coherent we space, which is something that I want. And I added to this, I want coherent we spaces, spaces in the, in the plural. So I want more than one, I want more than one we space that's coherent. And of course I recognize that that's, a, that's an ideal that I have that may not be shared with anyone here. But I do know that now that I present this, you guys know what my intention is. And I've made it as explicit as I can. I've even drawn a picture. <laughs> and, you know, I, and then, I can, then it's my responsibility to uh, direct my behavior in a way that, that, can make, that can make that possible and desirable. I believe the, the long-term consequences of such an, uh, an uh, the effects of this might be that more people can recognize patterns and that the more patterns you can examine, there are other patterns that are, that are more available. So, and I believe that patterns and making patterns and discovering patterns actually changes the cosmos. This is a belief I have. Just as you believe, Mark, that, there's, that free will is an illusion, I don't share that belief with you. I languaged, I, I appreciate where you're coming from and there's a very long tradition. I also have other beliefs that I wanna put my attention upon and develop further. And I, I am making the assumption that so does everyone else here have, have beliefs that we share in common. We have beliefs that we probably don't share. Um, however, that doesn't stop us from getting together and creating a coherent we space. We don't have to fragment and divide or try to conquer and manipulate. Um, and I think this is our, uh, this is a big challenge for us online, especially because most of the online communities fragment very quickly. Um, and I think the fact that we've uh, been coming together like this on the Cosmos Cafe, I think I was at, I was at the first one, wasn't I? I think it was the hurricane Harry uh, in Houston, it was you, me, and somebody else. Maybe TJ? TJ, you, me, and TJ hung out. <laughs> and so it just became a tr an attractor. We kept hanging out. And now I can I come and go, and uh, when I see a topic that seems interesting, I had the, the privilege of developing a few topics and getting a lot of support from the members here. So I hope, uh, so I believe we have a tradition and uh, I hope we can keep that going and do it do it even better. I think the guests that we've had on, um, I've enjoyed uh, the conversations, and um, I'm aware this is a performance, and we're not just talking to each other; we're talking to a public. So I believe there's a difference between public discourse and just you, one of us, hanging out over a beer somewhere. <clears throat> um, where, which would be private, and you know, I, I might say things that I would not say in a public space. So I believe we all have to sort of monitor ourselves. And then one more thing, and then I'll, uh, I, I think the per first person is a, that's a challenge for me, because I tend to be a, a storyteller primarily. I like to tell stories, I like to listen to stories. Nothing makes much sense with, unless there's a story that goes with it. And so I'm, um, but I also don't want to become a slave to the pronoun I, the first person. Uh, I, I recognize that there's objectivity, there's a third person, there are multiple third person accounts. And I believe that the healthy, a healthy community be, would be a community that can deal with first person, second person, and third person. And um, in a flexible way, rather than get frozen in just a third person account, which is what I've observed in a lot of Wilbur, uh, Wilbur exercises. Um, Ken Wilber's a philosopher, some of us know. Whereas, and I just found out that 99.9% .9 of the conversations revolved around what Ken Wilber thinks about Plotinus, what Ken Wilber thinks about Aristotle, what Ken Wilber thinks about Charles Alexander. And I got to the point where I don't care what Ken Wilber thinks about anything. What do you think? And I well, often 
just glacial stares. Maybe they thought I was being rude because I was more concerned about what they thought than Ken Wilber. But I think this is the difference between a cult and something a little more uh, friendly to diversity and style. I, I hope we can continue to be uh, appreciate that people have a very different style. And I hope we can encourage that. Thank you. Um, I want to express that John's, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, the issue of third person, first person is very important to me as far as, and I, hopefully this will tie into what we're going on. Um, as far as my healing with trauma, because when I was traumatized significantly, personally, part of the reality of, of what they know about what happens to the brain when you're tra traumatized is you're hypervigilant. Your nervous system is put in a tape loop or a loop where you are constantly monitoring and afraid of anything like that happening again, even on the most, I mean, just innocent level. And so by studying the third person science through Peter Levine, it actually helped me turn towards my eye that had been traumatized. And this is where I, I don't know how to language the, or work with the tension between free will and determinism in, in any significant way in relationship to you guys, because I kind of just accept that in many ways you guys are more articulate and I'm not putting myself down. I'm just saying I'm still working with articulating the experience. But it helped me, oh, I have an option of not getting stuck. If I understood the science, having that open, opening the science to heal and know, oh, it's okay to have a new eye, you know, to grow something beyond to, from what I got trapped in. Technically, I was trapped in it even before the trauma. And I didn't realize that the trauma kind of just brought it to the surface more. and. And then as I've moved on and moved through, then I, I understand, oh, wait a minute, there's this third perspective of intersubjectivity of how, how do I use this knowledge and experience to interact with others in many different ways. And, and I had to learn how that, that was something I had to learn as I went along because there was plenty of times in the midst of my healing, I wasn't doing a good job, but thank God for the third person perspective to help me understand, uh, give me some perspective without totally giving up on having an eye. Go ahead. Oh. That's, that's all I wanted to bring to the table about this issue. Last week, I know uh, everybody held the space, but I, I do. I looked at the tape, and I know that I got my, I, my, I got instead of trigger, I got animated. <laughs> is what I say, you know, because part of the trauma was over control. Was is, you know, you're, oh, oh my god, I can't move, I can't move, move, oh! you know, and I had to learn. No, relax, my. You, you're not, you don't, you know, relax into being stuck so you can get unstuck. That's my, my, my personal concrete experience with the tension that John's bringing, bringing up with these, trying to find new ways to talk about these polarizing ideas in my experience. Right. I, I really appreciate what you just shared, Michael. That resonates with my experience also. Thank you. Post-traumatic post stress. And I'll admit some of the tension around this free will debate triggers my post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. 
as uh, I was told that I was nothing. You will never be anything. No one will ever love you except for me. Mm -hmm. That was my mother talking. Yeah. Um, uh, these are the worst kinds of things a human being can say to another human being. And yeah. the way a child does it is they split. Mm -hmm. Not just into one part, two parts or three parts, but many parts. If yeah. they're lucky enough and they have enough peer-to-peer -peer support as adults, they can re redo it. Right. Um, but, but, you know, and life itself can bring forward certain kinds of adventures where, you know, you glue yourself together after those traumas, you put yourself together and you can become a very high achiever in certain conventional ways. But there is that, you know, that hollowness, which I think is a lot of what existentialism is about, is a very successful, rich, wealthy people um, who have the best of everything feel empty inside. So I believe that the extent existential crisis and the free will debate are all related. And I also think the zombification of a lot of AI is just a reprise of you are nothing. You don't mean anything to anybody. It's you are just an illusion. And, and that triggers my high anxiety. So I'm doing my best right now to yeah. handle this tension yeah and 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 the number one uh, sorry mark uh, the number one metaphor that i kept working for to undo is being a victim right because that's what happens with especially i you know all trauma is on a spectrum some have it worse than others it's individual but they, they have mapped out ways of understanding that this is where science is beautiful and P peter levine is beautiful mapped out wherever you are on the spectrum there's ways to mm, in, in, intercede intervene you know there's ways and one of the most simplest ways especially if you're working from a high anxiety trauma hypervigilance is be around a uh, certain use certain breath exercises to breathe out when you and and get very somatic and be around groups that have similar but another one that's real critical is ever so gently turn back towards what's been trapped gently turn back so that you can show yourselves that happened then this is now right and it's very gentle and that's why i resonate with some of your language, John, as far as how slow down, the, the slow mind, slow down, chunking down, uh, that resonates with me 100% uh, because. And, and that comes out of Peter Levine. Yeah. Peter Levine yeah. is, by the way, we he could be called third a third person account. Yeah. He's something more objective with the, the polyvagal therapy polyvagal nerve and what we know now about the physiology of stress and and um, trauma and he's been a very articulate spokesperson mm -hmm. uh, and he's worked with thousands of, of, of vets via you know from Vietnam and he's worked and uh, with individuals and had successful outcomes right so that's the intersubjective we space he's entered into and now he can make models that are effective. But well, that's that, what I think that interplay is extremely crucial that we have an I, a we, and a they, them, it. Well, and this is what confuses me about biological determinism. And maybe it's just my limited view on it. When I have somebody like Levine that's studying the biology of trauma and showing there's a way to change it, that gives me hope that determinism isn't an absolute in a way i mean this is my rough way of entering this dialogue it is it, the term of determinism just I, I i don't totally get it when i've used peter levine's being a biologist understanding everything that's going on actually in-depth biology and 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 act i don't know if he's advocating free will but i know he's advocating you're not completely determined by what happened to you. Well, so I have I another story 
Okay. <laughs> Supplement in yours, but to, to, uh, as a contrast or maybe a compliment to yours, but I also want to open the floor to other people. If any of other people want to join please. in. Or change the topic. Yeah, please. Yeah. Mark had but I do. I do need to go at the top of the hour, but I, yeah, I wanted to hear from Mark, but I do have a way of maybe bridging Mark's necessary illusion idea or what was it? The Robert Saplopsky video that you're talking about? Sampolsky, isn't Mark? it? Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know. His, but I, I know that guy has severe depression. He, he's studied it. Uh, he's a biologist of some sort. And so he, he knows from experience, uh, this, that to go from seeing free will as a necessary illusion and including compassion, including forgiveness like that, that's for him, perhaps maybe a, a barrier for him has always been this depression. Um, so I haven't seen the video, so I'm not doing it justice here, but he, he um, approaches it by state, stating this is a necessary illusion. And I, I also agree with that point of view, and, but it's not the full picture as um, Mike, Michael and John are getting it. Um, it's it's more of what Michael I think termed as a grounding point for him in a certain way. Um, so maybe for this Robert Seplopsky, whatever his name is, it 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 can be seen as a grounding point for jumping into reaching not necessarily higher levels, um, but better or more comprehensive forms of conversation. So we're here. Um, other people are in different time zones. That's going to be a factor. So you can start with these biological issues that we have or practical issues. And then from there, I, I had lack of sleep or I just ate lunch and I've got to go to the bathroom or I'm, I'm working here and I've got to go. And then once you bridge out of that, you're jumping into psychological issues. So we've discussed that from the get go, um, whether you're awkward or haven't been able to have these conversations um, or it could even be on the more negative side. The person who's sitting right in front of you, you, you know, is has an issue or you have an issue with females or a female has issue with males, or you have an issue with gender association, whatever it might be. So that's going to be another barrier. And then you can bring that into a community. There's all sorts of issues that are going to arise, but to see, to at least see partially that, or from the, as the grounding point to see this biological makeup as giving us a, a barrier towards um, absolute free will, maybe. I, I just want to respond um, briefly, unless someone else has a, a burning, when you say a grounding point, How many grounding points can we have? Perhaps For me, infinite, um... yeah, it's infinite probably. For me, what you're describing grounds this person, or maybe even some persons here in this call, ungrounds me. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to appreciate that. One size does not fit all. And I will, when I was about 12 years old and I was figuring out I was erotically different from others <clears throat> and that the, the whispering behind my back, people calling me faggot and queer, like my, my mother, my grandmother having these conversations, I started to go look things up like homosexuality in the dictionary. And I started reading encyclopedias. I read sociology. I read psychology. I read a wide range of topics besides the Bible. And there seemed to be a, a, a consensus that homosexuality was a crime, it was a disease, and homosexuals were doomed to a loveless life of promiscuity, alcoholism, and drug addiction. 
which actually in some cases is true. A lot of gay people have gone that direction. Um, but I, I just said, okay, these are the experts and they're wrong. I made up my mind, no teacher, no support, no one around giving me a blessing. And I said, they're wrong. And I'm gonna do something different. And I started to read other, I read Jean Genet and I read, uh, I read a lot of other books, a lot of uh, other uh, theorists. And I started to realize that wasn't the consensus, although it was a very large consensus, but there was always a small margin, marginal group that was exploring something different. The areas of aesthetics and theory and plays and fiction and movies, the arts especially. So I started to orient myself in a very different direction. And I found a peer group in my teens and I was very lucky that I was, I was rescued and I was able to go in a very different direction, a healthier direction. But I'm just saying this is something each of us has to figure out what the ground is for each of us and I think we have to really be careful about saying this is this, my ground is the ground because it's not. Your ground may extremely destabilize another person. So I believe we just need to be very appreciative of this tendency, a very human one, to like my ground is the ground, everybody else's ground too. Um, I believe that if we want to preserve pluralism and, and prevent totalizing um, totalizing structures, totalitarian structures. We're going to have to somehow find a way of living with this, you know, um, ground on ground, ground on ground, this reconstruction, this deconstruction process, and then a reconstruction process. So I believe we can change meanings. There's a certain amount of destabilization we can create new meanings and we can, the more of us who can detect patterns in ourselves or observe other people's patterns, the better off we're going to be. And I, because I think we'll be more creative and more flexible. So thank you for that, Doug. I, I just wanted to mention the the video I linked with the Tara Westover, I, her story is remarkable in that she was raised with, okay, here's another ist. I don't think we can get away from ists. A, <laughs> a, a, a survivalist in Southern, Southern Utah. Uh, and it was a very closed, they, they were they went to a Mormon church, but the and I know people like this. Uh, he was a survivalist, and he believed in the the Illuminati, and there was a one this world order, and and so he was very and and that's what she grew up with. And they didn't go to school; they were homeschooled, and and she had a very abusive brother. But she also had a brother who who got away and went to went to college. So uh, she self taught herself stuff, and 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 then at age seventeen took the ACTs and got into uh, Brigham Young, and from there she wound up at. Cambridge through the Gates scholarship thing. It's just an incredible story she tells. And part of it is trying to reconcile <clears throat> the estrangement from her family, writing this book and, and going public and being then estranged, shunned, by her mother and her mother told her that she didn't believe her. She told her mother about the, and her mother was very uh, smart. Uh, her mother didn't believe her when she told how abusive her brother was to her. She had, I think there were seven kids. So some of them were <laughs> nicer, better than others, but this one really a, 
physically and emotionally abused her. And she got her, she got herself out of there and, and, and taught herself a different reality than the one her father, you know, she learned from when she was born. She had no birth certificate, no schooling, no just, and to listen to her, she, she's absolutely amazing. And her story is, a, a, is just incredible. And I linked it because I thought it was relevant to people talking about growing up, being traumatized, abused, and, 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 and she, she did have therapy. And one of the interesting things is she, she went to therapy in order to get the strength to write the book and publish the book because she knew she still cares deeply for her, for her family. Uh, she doesn't, you know, they're all bad. And she thinks now perhaps her father was, you know, mentally something, uh, you know, but there are a lot of people like that. And, and a lot of children don't escape. And she would, and I use the word escape. She got away. She went to school. She got an education, and and now she's a PhD in history. She, uh, but for the first, I don't know, up through puberty, she believed what her father told her about the world. That's the only world she knew. So it's a it's a it's a remarkable, fascinating story. And I thought it that the group would like to you know it just the the human uh, the human spirit of course i don't know she's one in a million then you have people like uh, dylan roof you know who went into the church in charleston and and sat down and prayed with the black congregation and then pulled out his pistol and shot them all and obviously he and he was living you know as a kind of a throwaway kid so people do different things with, with horrible circumstances and some of them make it out and some of them don't. And it isn't, determinism doesn't mean it's determined from the get go. It, it, I think it's misunderstood when people talk about determinism. It's not, you can, some people uh, like this girl grew up in, gosh, just no, uh, talk about authoritarian. Uh, and, and she got out, she got out and now she, who knows? She's 32. Who knows how it all ends up? Uh, well, like, like Ed say, we know how it ends sort of some people. <laughs> Well, a lot, a lot of people believe in, in, you know, there's more to this life than, uh, than, you know, the biology and the being born in 1950 and dying in 2020. So anyway, that's all I, that's why I linked it. I thought it was very pertinent. Well, it was, I watched it and it was very good, Mark. I, I found it along the lines that you you said it was. Um, I liked it too, Mark, thank you. It was good. I just think that, mm, how do I put this? I just think part of my journey has been to really honor the tension that does arise between perspectives and especially when we reduce it down to a polar perspective. That tension to me, I always keep it as a mystery, as an unknown. And 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 I'm actually have learned to be really receptive to appreciating the unknown of of something, even though I have a polarity going on. You know, uh, and and this has only come upon me since my last trauma <laughs> 18 years ago um, because it was only through I 
I sent uh, Ed a email the other day that the phrase is trust the struggle. <laughs> you know, uh, I do personally have a intuition belief that whatever my life is now, I'm accepting that there may be something beyond this life. But that comes out of my experience of having to, especially my last trauma, of moving through the experience of experiencing that as far as I was concerned, I was dead. That that experience, even though I came back to life, that thought that thought that I was dead was really, really, and I will say this cleanly, it was freaking intense. So I just appreciate the mystery or the unknown. Maybe it's because of the Beatles magic mystery tour. I find, I find it interesting. Some people become who they are because of what happens to them. And other people become what they are in spite of what happens to them. And we don't know why it's one or why it's the other. And some people who are become what they are because of what they have become something else in spite of what they have come up with. There's this, this to me, resilience within humanity that allows us to, to do a lot of things. I personally ascribe that to some modicum of free will that is not illusory, that we actually do make choices. And sometimes, but it's not, and this is because this is the other side of, um, let's say, the welfare debate that goes on in the United States. People are poor because they chose to be poor. No, they didn't. So you can, you know, some people overcome that and some people don't. Some people are more entrapped by that and some other people aren't. So, you know, you can always, you, you can turn that around. That's why I don't like the word determinism. It's not that it's the wrong word. I mean, there is a certain deterministic aspect to it. I just like to, to rephrase that because it disposes people to make certain kinds of choices as opposed to others. But it really doesn't, in the end, say what's going to happen because we have enough, we have enough examples of where it doesn't. The... One of the negative sides of that is the Horatio Alger rags to riches story that gets propagated as myth as well. And, you know, if you work hard enough, you'll get ahead. Well, if working hard enough to get ahead, then there's, you know, a million poor women in Africa who should be, you know, the queens of the world. But they're not because they work harder than anybody else just to survive. So, you know, it, it, a lot of it depends on the context and a lot of it depends on on what we do with what we have when we when we have it and we can we can research and we can and examine and we can study but it's very hard to to find out what's really the case you know very often we hear well the majority of neuroscientists agree so what they agree about what they may agree about the same false conclusions because it suits whatever it is that they that they want to hear. There, there's no there's no objectivity. There's no truth value in that. It's, they just simply agree. Well, that's fine. And if I, and and things tend to move in different directions because others, like John has pointed out, maintain tension and disagree. It, it's good to do that. It's good to to be skeptical, but it's not good to absolutize any of that. We have to remain you know maintain a certain amount of variability. And a certain amount of going with the flow, resisting the flow, trying to find, you know, swimming in the current and against it and whatnot. And it's, and it's a real tricky, uh, challenging way to go about things. You know, because we, we can all read the same things and all come to different conclusions. I have to tell a story. Um, in my senior year in high school, we had to write a thesis. And I had a little, I had a little, uh, School marm English teacher, Miss Brunelli. 60, she was 65. She was heading for retirement. She'd never married. She'd been a teacher for 40 years at the school. You know, one of those classic things. 
And as that young adolescent, uh, know-it-all cocky asshole that I was, uh, probably still am to, to a certain residual degree, um, I decided I was going to write my, my senior thesis on homosexuality because it would gross her out. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, like John, I, I went and did the research and I, and I came to the conclusion they don't know why or why not. And a lot of people think it's really bad. And other people can't really say that they don't think it's bad because there was a lot of social uh, stigma that was associated with this. And in the end, the cl conclusion was, we, we need to look at this more closely and figure out, well, what the hell is this and what's going on? If we're going to, if it's an issue, then we should deal with it openly and honestly. That was, that was my conclusion. She got her revenge. <laughs> She made me read my thesis to the class. <laughs> Need, needless to say, John, I had, 20, I had 20 people sitting there that had to kept, kept picking their jaws up <laughs> off the table. Yeah. But it was a, it was, it was a very, it was a <clears throat> very enlightening experience for me because and and she's one of the she's one of the people I have in my memory as as one of the the true teachers. You know, she she was the kind of person she came up and thanked me for finally writing about something that mattered. That those were the words that she that was the first time I'd ever heard that kind of phraseology, and it and it made a deep impression on me. I just you know I I I, I loved this woman as much as I wanted to aggravate her because she was really good at what she did. And and Ed, it's people like you who have changed the landscape for people like me. Because um, I remember a friend of mine, she was studying to be a psychotherapist and she, you know, she got interested in gay culture because she yeah. was going to have to deal with gay clients and she was yeah. a straight person. She knew a lot of gay people socially, but she came across a, a famous researcher in the area of a gay sexuality who was a woman, a straight woman. Mm -hmm. She was like, it's really remarkable that a straight woman came forward and did all this research that debunked the consensus mm -hmm. in the psychiatric world. And uh, she was had a question mark around that. And I said, well, straight people were not even allowed to have this <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Straight people yeah. were already excommunicado. You mm -hmm. couldn't get, you couldn't get into a school. You couldn't get a job much less get married or teach school if you were openly gay. Mm -hmm. You could only function if you were in, the, uh, in an underground and you were in, a, it was secret. Yeah. So it wouldn't be a gay person who would be liberating gay people. It would be straight people. And that's what happened actually. A lot of straight people came forward, did this research. They had clients who were gay and they said, you know, this isn't a pathology. We need to yeah. take this off the books. And they did eventually. The American Medical Association took it off the books. It was no longer a pathology or a disease and it didn't need treatment. Um, but I think that's very important because I remember like in the 90s and Ellen DeGeneres and a lot of uh, celebrities were coming out and there was a big shift in consciousness that was happening. A lot of that had to do with straight people admitting that they had gay relatives, they had gay parents, they had a gay uncle or a gay, and they, because I said, you know, I don't have to, I don't want to come out anymore. I've come out every fucking day of my life. I'm sick of it. Why don't you straight people start coming out and admit that you know gay people that you care about <laughs> and that you like and that you actually love exactly. and do things for you. And as soon as that started to happen, this whole culture starts to shift and you see the law, the sodomy laws, you know, starting to be thrown out and all of these, these pseudo uh, arguments that have been and junk science that has been used to back up these, these uh, in incredibly harsh and criminal laws. So anyway, I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's the discourse events that I pay real attention to is when someone comes forward and says something that's alternative to the norm or the, or the doctrine. And I think that's a high risk move to make especially if you were a young person in school. So, but I think it's those kinds of efforts that actually over maybe generations create, you know, gigantic shifts. Yeah, I, I went through a period 
a period going back and I lived in San Diego and being exposed to gay culture and friends and stuff. And I go back and my parents are Episcopalian and, and I was bringing up the subject with my mom and whoa, did I hit a hot button because she was coming from what she was, uh, you know, told about the Bible and stuff. It actually, you know, cooled down, but it, I started reading Bishop Spong and, and certain religious people that were giving a different take on even the Bible's understanding of that issue and stuff. And yeah, and I also was associating with theater so that I had a lot of contact with that way. And uh, I guess it goes to your point, John, that even straight people had to go through a, a, an opening of having the discussion. Right. Even straight people, you know. And that's and, very destabilizing for some people. And this goes, this actually, this that dynamic goes with racism. It goes with any kind of kind of conflict like that. Like uh, I've had to step up with my son and help him understand. Yeah, I'm an old white fart and I'm getting a lot of shit for being straight and white because Donald Trump is acting poorly of my generation or my group, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and and I don't agree with it. And I get it, Jeffrey. You know, the way people talk to you is to demonize you and call you names. But sometimes you just need to sit and listen to their experience of interacting with people like me. Hmm. And I've witnessed. I've witnessed friends be taken and it's taken me a long time to stand up in the presence of that and go, no, you don't get away with that shit. It's wrong. And it, and it does take courage. It takes, <clears throat> takes a lot of heart. Hmm. Thank God I was raised with Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Are you on mute? You're on mute, Ed. You're on mute. You're on mute. Yeah. Unmute. Yeah. That's it. Now? Okay. Yeah. I, I said there are certain corners of the United States where that didn't matter. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi and, um, and Martin Luther King didn't matter at all. I grew mm -hmm. up in one. And, and that's why it's, I'm not going to consider it trauma, but the word escape that Mark used is, is, is the right one. I grew up planning my escape. I was going to leave. John can relate to this. Whether you're in Texas, Mississippi, you have you have to escape. You have to get out of where you are because this is going to be your undoing if you stay there. Right. And, right. Because it was obvious from all those jaws dropping on the table, I wasn't making a lot of friends. Okay. <laughs> but fortunately, it was my senior year in high school, and I was out of there anyway, so I wasn't going to be around. Didn't so you you you. You have to become a cultural ref refugee, actually. I mean, yeah. I came from New York, lived right. in East Village. There was a, it was a gay mecca. It was either, it was San Francisco or it was New York right. in the village. These right. were the two places where you were safe sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. yeah. That didn't, there was no guarantee that you'd be safe. I mean, people do have come in with machine guns, gone into a gay bar and mowed people down. This was happening in the 80s. and. Um, T taking bats and, you know, using pe gay people's heads to slam their bat against, you know. Mm -hmm. So these are the constant threats um, that we still had to endure. But I think it's very, it was very, it's very, it was very hard for, for straight people to even imagine that in the country that they lived in, things like this were happening. They didn't call themselves, they weren't homophobic, but they didn't believe that the reports that we were giving them were real. And it was very frustrating. And I think uh, I think black people and and women uh, who've been discriminated against, any group who's been dis dis discriminated against, including old white guys, you know, uh, ageism and sexism and homophobia, any kind of discrimination is almost invisible unless you're the one who's being discriminated against, right. and you but can articulate it in a clear enough way with others who who become convinced too that this is something that needs to change. 
Well, but it's it, not easy to do that. If you're a traumatized person, you keep your mouth shut and maybe for years don't say a word. Yes. And, and the fact is biologically, this, 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 um, tribalism or this, you know, anybody that's different is part of our biology. I mean, uh, it, 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 this is part of biology. I'm going to accept that it's shown that we have in our little brain that anybody that's outside our group, we're going to be frightened of. But we also have in our brain, it seems to be, and the evolution of culture, I guess, or, you know, new ways of and science to, well, okay, this is happening. How do I'm going to pay attention to this? How do I change it? Well, you change it by looking at it and having a conversation like we're having and going, do we really have to go down this road and be a, defined by, a, it, it's a fact, it's part of our biology. I'm always going to have a certain degree of need to be alert, to be alert in my environment of what might threaten me, but I don't have to be obsessed with it. Right. I can bring some nuance that, and and I all of us probably have experiences that if I'm going to walk into a certain group, I need to not get hijacked, but be alert. I'm walking in a group that, oh boy, I haven't been around and I need to yeah, just pay attention. You know, like an extreme example for me is I grew up in Southern California and I knew Hell's Angels. Do you think anytime I ran across them, I wasn't on high alert? <laughs> Because those guys, uh, fortunately, I had a cousin that was connected, and he just said, Mike, shut your mouth. Don't say anything. <laughs> you know? That's right. That's right. And that's the wisest thing to do sometimes. <clears throat> yes. Sometimes. Keep your mouth shut and keep walking and don't look back. Yeah. What, Ed? But by the same token, if we go back to Tara Westwood's story and what Mark told us, she told her mother that she was abused by her brother and her mother refused to believe it simply because it doesn't fit into the world you're in. So that's you can right. be amongst a group of people that you know. That's right. And that's right. Actually feel comfortable with. And that's where you need to be on more alert than you are with the other. The others is very obvious. Yeah, you know, it's, it's obvious. It's yeah. subtle when it's in the when it's in the close environment and you don't recognize that there is this. It cannot be because I can't believe that it would be. Yeah. And so reality is determined by my, you know, and I and I believe that generally speaking, that our our beliefs determine our reality, our feelings tell us what to think. And so whatever it is that we happen to be feeling right, wrong or indifferent is influencing what what it is that we think and how we view the world and how we perceive what's around us. And so for something and that's that's one of the problems I have with you know, the United States and foreign policy, for example. It's just a given that this is the greatest country and the richest and blah, 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 and pipapo, whatever that means. And so I'm blinded to the fact that maybe they're doing something that's not on the up and up. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It, I, it, it goes to the point that even within my own family, I, I have, I'm on more alert than with obvious groups because, because, you know, they're close, you know, and, and you have beliefs about them. And this is one thing that I think these conversations and meditation has taught me. And and uh, Wright talks about uh, Buddhism is true. He gets down to the nitty gritty of the biology. We need to pay attention to the feelings in our bodies, the tension that arises. So that we, at that level, when you're bringing that kind of attention, you can actually influence automatic beliefs or constructs that were put in place when you were a young child growing up in your nervous system. You, he admits that that's what paying attention to feeling that way of going away from something, going towards something, but that feeling, noticing that feeling, bringing attention to it non-judgmentally helps you change your brain, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I imagine you're changing the brains of other people as well. No, and I relationship think, with they I see think, you calm and you're relaxed and you're making a claim that they don't that doesn't fit their world model of the world. They may not change their model of the world, but they'll recognize that you're coming from a place of authenticity. 
100%. And you may not want to be in relationship with people who have different, two different models of the world. You know, well, they yeah, it's, 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 model, it's, should it's, leave. it's like my sis, both my sisters are come from the persuasion of a very conservative Christian background. And I've gone through the stages of trying to <laughs> just try to have an open dialogue and, and that, well, went through that. Now they're, they're my sisters. They'll always be my sister, but we, we've come to a place that happens in families from my experience. They're my family, but I have a group of friends that are, I would call family in a deeper sense. I think Ed knows what I'm talking about. I, I, I think all we all, us, all of you, I mean, all yeah. of you, but I'd seen Ed's expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I know exactly what you're talking I, I was always the odd one in the family. Well, I was the odd one in the family until my youngest brother showed up and then I got off the hook. But um, but that has something to do with, you know, where, where children show up in a family. But it's, um, you can't talk to people who don't want to listen. Exactly. And so you don't need to waste the effort. And and I don't I don't need to verbalize and articulate everything I'm thinking all the time. Although some people <laughs> that. good but, point. <laughs> yeah. And but but it's important. So what, you know, this is you know, Mark has the same experience with his brother who's been born. There's just some you just don't talk about it. And it's not like you're avoiding something important. You're actually nurturing something that is important and that is the this familial relationship you nurture it by not ag aggressing on it by not tran you know trespassing on it by not putting it in the other person's face and making them think or feel or, or reevaluate what they're thinking or feeling you know just let it go and accept and you know because it's okay to accept things you know if we're going to change the world we're not going to do it all in one fell swoop that's for sure so you win, you fight the battles you can win, and you you know you win the battles that you then fight when you do that. But you know, I I learned very early on growing up in Western Pennsylvania, pick your fights. You you have to know which ones you want to get involved in, and which ones you 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 have to avoid in some way or another. You know, yeah. Where it's not culturally acceptable to just say no. <laughs> you have to find another acceptable way of doing that. You know, I. When I moved to, we moved from from Greensburg, where I where I grew up, to South Greensburg, which was a a suburb. It was in a former coal mining town. And back in those days, when you moved somewhere, you had to go find the biggest, toughest kid in the neighborhood, pick a fight, and get your ass kicked. If you didn't, you would never, ever, ever, ever have a friend there. You would have been excommunicated from the get go. So you just went in, you just went and got your ass whooped. And then everything was okay. I think that's the most stupid thing anybody ever came up with for a cultural whatever, you know, process or dealing with things, but that's the way it was. And I decide I realized at that point, you never want to be number one. The pacifist that I am. <laughs> <laughs> you never want to be the top gun because there's always this was the gun. I call it the gunslinger syndrome. There's always somebody who thinks they're faster, better, tougher, whatever, and they're going to come looking for you. OK, well, I didn't have to worry about those guys because I was never number one. But I did not feel inferior. I thought that that was a, a very. I'm going to say intelligent it was one of the few intelligent things I probably ever did in my life. But I thought that was an intelligent thing to do <laughs> is to be. Two or three, you know, kind of out of the, out of that spectrum of visibility. Just be in the background, whatever. And so there are a lot of times then later in life, simply because I was from South Greensburg, which was known as a very tight knit place. I had certain freedoms. I could simply be myself and nobody would probably want to challenge that because they assumed, and this is why I love assumptions. They assumed I had tons of friends in the background who were more than anxious, willing, and able to get into any rumble that happened to show up no matter where it was. So let them believe, 
my feeling, let people believe what they want to believe <laughs> because it can very well be to my advantage as well. I don't, I don't yeah. want to show them that what they believe is wrong. You know, sometimes they're, you know, if I'm going to be my own worst enemy, this is one time where I do project onto others from myself. I figure other people are probably, probably being their own worst enemy too. Oh, exactly. It worked well when I was a bouncer. Uh, I have a face and a look that people think that I come out of prison. Yet yeah, I, I'm a hippie. I'm a hippie. So I used it to my advantage. I raised my voice and, and, and I did a Muhammad Ali, you know, but I didn't want to fight. I, I, if I can avoid a fight, getting in a fight, I don't want to, I don't want to fight. But in the meantime, you're going to get the drill sergeant hippie coming at you. So think whatever you want to think. <laughs> Works for me. Yeah, I can relate. I solved a lot of, I solved a lot of interactions just because like you said, I let people have their assumptions of me. Yeah. It yeah. made it easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Yep. Does that mean we're back to necessary illusions? Mm. <laughs> or, or free will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, or or just to be persnickety, the actual word means to play. It has <laughs> roots in the in, in term uh Alan Watts pointed that out of illusion and Maya means to play. So I think that if I wanted to uh, embrace free will contrary to determinism, I'm just gonna play with what that means. <laughs> I'm just gonna play back and forth. How does that play out? I'm not gonna try to pull it apart. <clears throat> Well, I mean, you know, these are words. Yeah. Uh, and not only in uh, the realm of philosophy, but just in the domain of rhetoric, uh, mm -hmm. they um, they don't have inherent meaning. You know, they have histories, uh, they have contexts, and um, they have a pragmatics too, so far as in how they're used. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to what they may mean. So I think that you know, th there's different registers on which we can receive what the with terms like that mean. Uh, yeah. Earlier, you know, John referred to determinism as determining one personally, like your outlook, your prospects in life or your possibilities, your potentials. You're predetermined not to, you know, be able to succeed, not to have value, not to have, you know, something special to contribute or you know whatever but strictly scientifically like the deterministic idea isn't personal exactly it it's it's more about how phenomena emerge right it's more about the um the presence or absence in this view of an inherent conscious de um self-determining force in in the being and it's not just Western materialism that posits that kind of view, even Buddhism posits the conditionality of all phenomena. Everything that arises is conditioned by other things that arise, as well as by the non-arising, the, the, the unmanifest ground, if you will. Um, so I think there are more interesting ways to think about it than, than the you know, choice between, between one or the other. Uh, I think that you can have both, you can have deter determinism and you can have free will in a system where they're compatible or at least where they fade into each other. Um, Whitehead comes to mind and his, uh, no, his idea that emergence happens through apprehension of past conditions and then the arising of a novelty. So all those conditions, which you know, Wilbur equates with karma, are there, but there's some aspect there's some element that's not predictable in the present emergent moment and so even if you know all of those conditions all of those phenomena they're going to interact in a way that gives rise to something that couldn't have been um couldn't have been foreseen exactly 
uh, that's the definition of novelty. That's def the definition of the creative spark. And it allows you to have both, not only both determinism and free will, but it allows you to kind of situate them more on a spectrum where certain occasions, certain contexts, or even certain uh, beings in the sense of, of being, being more or less, um, having more or less access to that kind of creativity. Um, it allows you to have a spectrum where there's, there's less and there's more. And in an evolutionary framework or an evolution, evolutionary understanding, some beings like you know, regular old quote unquote dumb matter, rocks, air, etc., are less are, are more deterministic than others. A, a conscious human being, because there's so much um, there's so many layers of reality kind of underlying who we are as we as we you know, manifest ourselves, we are less deterministic, but aspects of us are very deterministic because we include more deterministic levels, the material level, the biological level, the chemical level, physical level, all of those are, are operating. We, we don't happen without them. Um, but there's an aspect, the more, the more that, see, I think part of the good thing about having determinism is the more that we understand about the ways that we're determined, the, the more we can find ways to outsmart our own <laughs> determinism. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think that that's the that that's the value. And afraid, uh, I, I was wondering, I was trying to remember where I saw it, but it's in, in Nietzsche, where where he essentially says, "Give me more determinism," uh, because the more the more that I have, the more that that opens up the horizon of the indeterminate, the horizon when there's where there's freedom to, to act. And I think that has to do with the pattern detection as well, because if you can be aware of a pattern, then you're not it by death you're not it you're separate from it it gives you kind of that transcendent transcendent wiggle room to act in a way that's different from the pattern to change the pattern and then i think i would argue that that action that act capacity to act capacity to change to act on a pattern that's observed is exactly where you would find free will but then once you act on it you may notice that that entails another pattern which uh, necessitates then understanding or seeing that pattern and acting differently if you choose to. So it doesn't end in, in one um, pole or the other. It's it's a um, um, it's a dynamic, you know that that allows for this creative emergence at the same time that there's the relative stability of manifest conditions supporting that emergence. I just wanted to add something to that. Um, um, you said determination, determinate, um, and free will. I would say that I'm, a slight variation in the vocabulary, because you know in physics they talk about in, the indeterminate. You can't be a particle, and you can't determine ahead of time the condition. Is it a particle or a wave? Um, so at that level, the subatomic level, it's indeterminate. So schemes to reduce mind to quantum physics, I think, are, are doomed. <laughs> because why would you reduce something as complex as mind to something as incoherent <laughs> as matter? <laughs> no one seems to know what it is. So I think we need to, we're needing, I think we're starting to reinvent what matter could be. And rather than saying you are just a phenomena, we're starting to like maybe ask more interesting questions like what could matter be that consciousness could arise from it? Rather than say there's no such thing as consciousness, cases cases over. So I believe in indeterminance, indeterminance, okay. But free will to me, I believe in free will. But I don't believe that I believe in will, that we have will. I believe it is free, but I don't say that it's not constrained. There's no such thing as freedom without constraints. So I am appreciative of what you're, the distinction that you're making about pattern and pattern detection. 
Uh, but I would say it's a little more slippery than that because I think the subject and the object are much more fluid. Like there's a pattern over there. I am detecting that pattern over there. I would say there's a relationship between you and that patterning process that's extremely hard for us to, to, to separate from without making it incoherent. Mm. So I'm also wanting to just show, put that in, and I can't get the language for this quite right yet, but there's, there's self-organization theory. Uh, they, they, they're saying it's like our systems, our biological systems are open and they are closed. Uh, open closure is the dynamic. Some of it has to be closed so that some of it can be open. But it's not either closed or it's open, it's both. Uh, each cell has a membrane around it and a nucleus inside of it and genetic material. But the genetics, gen genes we know now after the Human Genome Project flopped do not call all the shots. It's the, there's the epigenetics and what's happening outside that are determining or it perhaps influencing what's happening to the genetic material. And one of the things we're learning now is, uh, is bacteria. Bacteria may be calling, or not calling the shots, but having much more influence than we ever knew about birth rates, about fertility, about um, you know, depression, su suicide. Mm -hmm. some, some bacteria could uh, enliven you, some of it can depress you. Um, and if you're bombarding bacteria with, and the microbial world with antibiotics to serve very short-term goals, you, they could backfire dramatically. Um, like they're saying, there's some strains of tuberculosis that are coming back and there's no, there's no antibiotic that can um, get rid of them. Like, like streptomycin, I think, was the drug they used back in the 40s, eliminated tuberculosis. Well, some of it's coming back and it might be much more virulent than it ever was before because we thought we could outsmart the, the microbial world. We can't. We can't live without them, mm. without the microbial world. And they may be incredibly intelligent in ways that we, we, we can't figure out yet. They've been around a lot longer than we have. And when we're gone, they'll still be here. So I think that's symbiopoesis is what um, and uh, Haraway is calling this new kind of biology, a new way of thinking about biology is uh, we always think of this human experience as sort of detached and separate from uh, all the other patterns that we can detect. And we're the detect, we detect all the patterns out there. And, and the, she and other uh, biologists like her are, are much more, I think, offering a, a, a much messier kind of description. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're very uh, in symbiosis with uh, probably infinite, infinite amount of players. Some mm -hmm. of them are really teeny tiny, <laughs> mm -hmm. as well as very, very large and macro. So I think we have, um, but that, that we're organized in a certain way. I'm not going to, you know, I have a certain amount of bones in, in my human body, and that's not going to change in my lifetime. But what I eat and drink and the relationships I have and the environments that I'm in, that I have some control over, that's going to change my biology. The activities that you know, the air that I breathe. So all of our the the, the social organization and um, how we grow food, the pesticides, what we put in the pollutants we put into the air, those are going to change our biology, and that's culture. So that's what I find interesting is the interplay between culture and biology may be very very fuzzy. Not mm -hmm. to mention our psychology. What's how what separates you from me? Maybe maybe there's nothing really except our theories about what a self is, but that we're, we may be much more dynamic and fluid as well. So anyway, that's a very big question. Mm -hmm. I, no, I, pre I appreciate that. I mean, I think that uh, what's, what's so um, uh, interesting, enamoring even of the microbiological realm is just how chaotic, like how messy, slimy and um, Nonlinear, I guess it is. Uh, the philosophical problem, free will determinism. <clears throat> it's really a problem about it, it's 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 a mechanistic way of framing a mechanistic question, because you have a binary of one term versus the other, and you're trying to decide which one is true, and they're both ways of constructing how the universe works in this sort of 
you know, these are the puzzle pieces of it. And um, that's friendly to to reason. It's friendly to, to, to a mental way of um, representing reality for certain purposes. But I think what you're pointing out with respect to the microbiology as, you know, one uh, level that one level, I would say level, that's another mechanistic way of, I think, dividing things up. But one aspect of, of reality is that there are so many billions, trillions of interactions happening between the different cells, between those cells and your cells. And that's at the biological level. And then you add in, if you, if culture is something real, if consciousness is something that is not just what is represented, but is in the perceiving and in the living feeling experience of what's represented, then uh, it's, 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 it, it doesn't fit with the mechanistic way of putting the world together. You have to think differently. And I think that language works that way as well because words are a lot more like bacteria than they are like Legos. Uh, and so I like that. I like that. I would say it's an unweeded garden that grows to seed. <laughs> Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, you know. Definitely. All poetry is just an unweeded garden. And it's very hard to, um, without constraints, of course, you couldn't create an intelligible sentence. That's what syntax is. Mm -hmm. And we're making sentences we probably have never said or heard before every day. But, you know, we somehow figure out it, what, what, what's trying to be communicated because the, there is a structure and it does constrain us. Thank God or we'd have no freedom to create anything new or interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, before Mike, I just, I think that that's part of what, why I like conversations like this and part of why I even like taking up philosophical dichotomies that don't, only because they give us a chance to, to use the terms and to maybe reuse them. Like to, and in this way, I think it's also like bacteria because they break things down. You know, they, they, they take solid pieces of matter and they break it down into the component parts and, and you know, that can it creates a stink, but it also, <laughs> it, it also creates new soil. It creates new conditions. Exactly. To emerge. Gotcha. And so I feel like we're little, you know, amoebas here, uh, digesting, you know, the bits of our, our cognitive detritus and um, turning it into gold, uh, hopefully at least. Uh, I went back and I was reading uh, Marshall McClune, uh, some of his stuff, and there was a book out called uh, Trying to Correct How Misunderstood He Was. But I think this phrase I copied down fits in with Marco in a way because he was known to be an outrageous thinker in a lot of ways. And he claimed that he thought more with his this side of the brain than the left side. <laughs> um, how do I know what I think until I hear what I say? Yeah, uh, I think I think that goes to writing as well. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it because one of the in the book they were saying he was raised by a mother and I can't pronounce the word that elo el eloquent, you know, focused on how you use your speech. So he was more auditory than spatial. And that was one of his comments of when we went to writing, we became more visual and understanding the word became a obsession. And before then we were technically and I I go back that I think when we were lower, you know, way back when, our sense of hearing was very much more important because we heard the danger coming before we saw it, you know? And that's why oral traditions are still part of us. And I think in a way we're trying to augment and get that back into our system as much as we've moved forward. I, I, I love um, Marshall McLuhan. Um, I, I also, uh, Von Forrester, I think his name is, he was a cybernetician. Um, he said at the beginning of the computer um, revolution, he, he made this observation. Every observation is made by someone. <laughs> kind of paradoxical there. Um, 
because when you when you're claiming observation, that's a, when you're claiming an observation is objective. That observation is objective to whom? Because someone had to make that observation, and and that was that someone added something to that cybernetic principle. I think it was I can't remember his name. Oh, it was Martorana. Maturana, or maybe it was Varela, they were those Chilean biologists who came up with the uh, self-organization theory. But I, they said, to add to that, they said, everything that is said is said to someone, even if you're alone. Mm-hmm. And I've noticed that. When I'm alone and I'm talking to myself, there's someone there listening to it. <laughs> and I might have to edit what I say or repeat it, because that someone there who's listening to it, even if I'm alone, uh, has a big impact. And I, I believe that the poets and playwrights just amplify that tendency in all of us. You know. I'm sorry, Ed, did you say something? Do you ever, do you ever get smart-ass uh, responses? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I, I've called myself a dumb fuck a couple of times. Oh man, oh, oh, yeah. I probably do that more often than others. <clears throat> no, I think that's a hard thing to... for a writer, though. I mean, you have to learn how to hear yourself, uh, and you yeah. have to listen to your yeah to yourself. Um, that's, I mean, that's one thing that I struggle with a bit with with writing or even doing these talks we were talking about earlier going back and re-listening or re-watching the, the videos um i'm so hyper i'm i'm very i have a very strong critical faculty and so it's easy to you know i'm the the first target really for for, for that uh you know faculty uh and so i don't want to watch myself unless i'm really going to have time to process what i've said or how i feel you know i'm misarticulated or overarticulated or whatever other patterns I notice about my own way of, um, of communicating. Um, but when it's on a page and when you're going to perform it in a work of poetry or fiction or, or whatever it is, that's, it's a bit different because you're really trying to construct the, the best thing you can, not necessarily the best ego flattering thing you can, but the most authentic thing you can. It has to resonate true. It has to feel true. Um, n- not just, you know, work out as an equation, but, uh, but, um, be, be worth embodying. Uh, and, and I find that that's the really hard thing to get to, uh, because w- the way that you listen to yourself is really trained by, I think, and I'm not influenced, not determined by the ways that others listen to you or, or listened to you in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you, your your own sense of so fi- becoming um, a good listener probably is the very first thing uh, to even having free will you know because if you can't hear what your own will is if your own will the, the signal of that will is mixed in with you know all the uh, everything everybody else thinks about you all the other all the ways you're determined then it becomes hard to really exercise an original thought, an original insight. Yep. Well, I would just add <clears throat> original. Who was it who says there's nothing original under the sun? I think it was Shakespeare. Uh, but, yeah. but, you know, we have these... Um, and Octavia Butler said, but there are new sons. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so uh, I mean, uh, culturally, I think we're really, we're really into innovation and, you know, and originality. Um, but sometimes, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I think it was Emerson who said he sometimes will read someone who'll say something that was something that he hadn't, he had thought that he hadn't said. And he realized it was a brilliant thing to have said. He wished he had gone ahead and followed his own inclinations. Um, so a lot of, uh, so I think that's what's interesting about our dialogues and our trialogues here and our infant conversations uh, that we are opening up to other influence, that we can influence others and that can influence us. And um, 
because I feel like I'm a consortium, not just bacteria, but multiple voices and hybrids and collectivities, uh, collective intelligences and breakdowns too. I mean, this is not easy because, um, you know, some of the voices are very toxic and they're demonic and they come from a past. Um, and then there are voices that are highly elevated and extremely vast and intelligent, much more than my ego can handle. So I think it's, everybody has to sort of figure that out the best way that they can. Um, but I, I feel like it's, it's important to have uh, spaces that can handle those paradoxes of the, the pronoun I and what that could possibly mean. And that there will be exaggerations and distortions and deletions inevitably in every model that we come up with. And we could, you know, learn to be, learn to embrace that rather than guard against, oh, I don't want you to fuck up with my model. My model is pure and pristine. And, you know, I, I don't want anyone messing around with it. So that's why I think it's a real challenge to come up, to be flexible and have more than one model. Um, and I think this is what prevents us becoming a uh, cult is that we have more models. And I believe each of us is a modeler and we're, mo we're making up models all the time. And I just want to pay, pay more attention to that process. I think it's a fascinating process and uh, aesthetically pleasing to be in relationship with people who are aware that they're making things up and they're exaggerating and they're distorting and generalizing. If you, long, if you know you're doing it, then it's fine. If you don't know what you're, you're doing that and you're just coming up with the truth, I think we get in real trouble. <laughs> yeah. Um... But the, the thing about originality, I, I, I agree, culturally we valorize, romanticize uh, the original, the creator, the, the, the maverick, etc. Also the idea of genius as being, you know, the, the one who originates something new, the unprecedented, and the world has never seen. I think it has something to do with this determinism and free will because when, like if I'm, when I say something, that feels scripted in some way or predetermined or wrote or like I really didn't think it through that like I'm repeating something I heard it's not digested it's it it, it diminishes me in some way it diminishes what I have to offer whereas if I've taken in the the input listened to the voices um, sorted it through whatever way that I do, whatever that alchemy is, because it's it's a it's a weird kind of process. But then something comes out that I know is unique, and and that's right. It it it. Uh, um, there's something about that that's it's like the prize, you know, of the process. I think it's that breakthrough out of determinism you know, in, into, um, into the novel occasion. Uh, and I, th I think that's what art is for. Uh, I, I think science is for producing reproducible, predictable, predictable events. I think art is for producing singularities, something that from, you know, you can study it from a meta perspective, you can show patterns, you can show how you know, an artist may be influenced by their father or their mother or a thousand other things, but the event itself of that novel um, occasion coming into being is, if it's not singular, then it isn't art. <laughs> well, but it, it, it could be in the in-between, can it? It's a process. Yeah. You can't be authentic unless you know what it's like to be false. And that doesn't feel right. That's not true. Um, it's a, but I know that. And so I can change my behavior accordingly. But sometimes, you know, truth, tell the truth, but tell it slant, like Emily Dickinson says. And some people, if they tell the truth, they get clobbered for it. So they tell a story. And, you know, they get their message through. And people listen. And um, people's behavior may change because of a story that a person was created enough to come up with, rather than saying, this is your truth, and this is my truth, and we're going to have a, a debate. Um, and duke it out. And I think that's what culture does, basically, is change the story. More stories are being told by different people in different contexts, and things start to shift. And I just, but, but I so agree about the singularity and about rhythm 
and the distinct rhythm. And if it ain't got that, you know, if it ain't got that swing, you know, it don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that swing. So I, I heard a study that in, they had a dark room, a group of people, and each person had like um, lights on their joints. So there was a light bulb on the shoulder, you know, the hip, the knees, the, the feet. And uh, they had these, these people moving around in a dark room with just these uh, lights on their joints. And then they had the same people look at a film of this video. So it was just a black screen with lots of lights moving around. But every person could recognize the rhythm of their own body. I think that's extremely interesting. But they cannot recognize the back of their own hand if it's lined up with other, the back of other people's hands. You can take a photograph of a, a row of, of the back of people's hands and they'll look at them and they can't pick out the back of their own hand. But they can see in a dark room uh, their own rhythm. So I think that's uh, just a corroborating what you're saying, Marco, about what the artist and the poet especially, but I think all artists to some extent are trying to capture that unique rhythm. And you know when the rhythm is right. And when it's like you. It feels like It feels like Yeah, exactly. And you can also feel like when you're when you're mimicking someone else or you're you're playing a part, you know, and you're you're sort of doing a kind of camouflage in order to make a social setting a little more friendly. Um, so you have to, you know, I, I did, I'm very careful about the truth and, you know, and how you go about presenting the truth simply because I, I had such a problematic childhood and fight, flight and freeze was the, was uh, something that I was very used to. And I got around to telling the truth and people didn't like it when they heard it, but it was bon voyage. <laughs> and I think that was a, a pattern that I, don't necessarily want to replicate as an adult, you know, that I have to, uh, to fight to tell the truth. Um, and I think that's a pattern that I'm trying to uh, negotiate with. Rather than fight to tell my truth, I can just relax. Or if not relax, at least be aware that uh, this is a pat. this is that I'm being triggered. That doesn't mean anyone's attacking me. And I don't have to attack them. I might be able to be more versatile. Right. Um, my communications, but that's not easy. But if no. I can just let people know, hey, wait a minute, I'm being triggered right now. <laughs> that's just offering them the, a favor of like, look, I want to stay in communication with you, but I'm just being triggered, and I have to, and I ha and it's my responsibility to be with that, rather than deflect it or deny it or de or define it in a way that actually becomes a, a kind of defense. Because I think people can pick up on people when they're defending something, yeah. and they're not saying it, but they are in a defensive yeah. posture yeah. and it inhibits the flow of what could be shared. Well, the flow to me, this goes to the point of courage of heart. And I can only speak for myself feeling as an artist. I'm not sure what kind, I just have an artist temperament. Um, heart is very important. Hearing my heartbeat maybe more than my voice becomes important at time. Uh, the two go together, don't get me wrong, but sometimes I've had to breathe out, still my voice, and listen to my heart. Then the voice comes back. And it comes back with, I'm getting goose pimples. It comes back with authenticity right. and true, a feeling of true, Marco, like you talked about. But so. And other people can feel it. Well, the, yeah, because through the voice, through now, the voice. I'll, now I'll go science. Science has showed electromagnetically you project from your heart more than from your head. Energy, the electromagnetic energy. So if we're in, in, you know, it's a it's a struggle, and it's but it's a skill set. I just believe these are skills we can take on, but we've been taught. Oh, no, no, that's fantasy. You know, it, this is a part of, I don't know how to term it, but the neglected intelligence of having a body with a mind. <laughs> I don't know any other way to say it because, you know, it's like, 
I, I don't know what else to say. Well, I think it reconnects us all to the field. We, yeah. We've been talking about field effects. And I believe that we can, we can when we get centered, we know enough about polyvagal theory and how the, the social engagement system gets connected right. to heart, yeah. heart, voice, eyes. Right. That there's a deep connection between the eyes, the voice, and the heart. So I have and a question. That connects so I us. I have a question, John. It seems from my traumatic experience, we actually have to go back and make friends with our defensive system is right. part of feeling the field. Right. Because, because within the field, there are certain things we have come concretely as we were children, learn to be scared of or go, clo go, go towards. Right. So to me, this whole thing, learning process to me was actually re-engaging my protective defense system in a more adult rather than an unconscious uh childish adolescent manner and I, I and i'm still working with it it's a lot better but i still go to the adolescent you can't tell me what to do <laughs> sure Well, just one last point on that, and maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll be heading out after this. But uh, one thing I've been working with writing and listening uh, is the distinction. It's, it's not listening to my body, but listening through my body. Uh -huh. yeah. So, like letting my whole body feel the field. Yeah, and yeah. That's what I'm actually listening. I'm not. It's not even a two, because there isn't a. There isn't a, a there there. There isn't a. I, I think that when we when we have this mind body split, this this idea that there's a, a self and then there's the body, that they're not co arising. Um, we we kind of position. We create this ball, you know, like this homunculus. Uh, that word came through a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I know which Just one. I know which one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, but I, I've been, I, I, I feel like I've heard silence in a new way in just the last few days because I've been up at like two, three in the morning when it's really, really quiet, except for the trains that occasionally come through, and and I've been doing meditations that um, the yoga nidra meditations. I haven't listened to your dream talk yet, but I'm sort of preparing the ground for them and. One of the instructions in the meditations are to bring your awareness after scanning through the whole body, all the points, etc. You bring your awareness back to the, the heart space, and uh, and I found that even in conversations, I'll start to go back there and feel when it's contracted, and then feel when, like right now, <laughs> but <laughs> also feel feel when it starts to f flow, and I can. It's almost like a, I'm receiving the real, and then it's circulating through, and the flow is 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 different when when that meditation is like active. So, um, th these conversations have been really helpful. The podcasts as well. Little things come in that um, become important in in um, in my practice. Uh, so, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Very enjoyable. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.